It's a pleasure to be here again. I want to share some wonderful news uh, with you and the rest of the class. Um, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of a spike watching the YouTubes before the uh, midterm and the makeup. Uh, there are two components to that stat. Uh, stat. Uh, one is those people who actually came to watch the clip or clips and those who actually stayed all the way to the end, which was sometime an hour or even more. The good news is that although we had a huge spike in terms of uh, people interested looking at the uh, clips, we had close to 50% retention rate. 50% of those who came stayed all the way to the end and watched it. So if you have a clip which is about 700 hits, which has about 700 hits, if you say 50%, it means it was watched 350 times to the end of the session. And this is something which makes me and the rest of you, I hope, energized to come in once again on Sunday and do this for the rest of your classmates. Thank you very much for a wonderful job you, Gwen, uh, you guys have, have done so far. Now, what we did uh, uh, before the midterm is going to take a twist, a turn. Before the midterm, the circuit was pure resistive. We had voltage sources and current sources. We talked about Thevenin, Norton. We talked about superposition, nodal, and mesh, different techniques, KCL, KVL law, topology law, component law. We talked about all of that. We are going to actually benefit from the knowledge we gain before the midterm, and we are going to apply it later uh, in, in after the midterm scenarios. The after midterm scenario, not only we have resistors and voltage source and current sources, but we also have uh, different types of new components which are called capacitors or inductors. These are called storage elements. Ideally, they are not supposed to waste any energy. They are supposed to store energy, and when the time comes, they are supposed to release the energy. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go into chapter six. Chapter six, half of it, I'm going to talk about the capacitor, and then put the capacitors inside a circuit, parallel series combinations, and see how we can actually shrink it into one simple component. Then instead of continuing the topic with the inductor on chapter six, in chapter six, I'm going to move into chapter seven. I'm rearranging this stuff to make it more um, basically uh, fluent, more in line with each other. So half of chapter six I'm going to cover, then I'm going to go into chapter seven, and in chapter seven I'm going to talk about um, RC. When I get to chapter seven, um, I'm going to uh, uh, skip the way that the textbook has discussed this and in one shot explain the uh, entire scenario and then through numerous examples I'm going to show you how we handle this. Interesting enough, one of the things we do in chapter 7 is we get rid of the capacitor sometime, not all the time, sometime, and we basically turn it over to a pure resistive. And that's why what we learn before the midterm is going to be beneficial instrumental for the success of, of the chapter seven examples. Now let's begin chapter six and I would like to introduce what a capacitor is. Capacitor, capacity, and the first letter of this uh, word is C. So capacitor, by a common sense, should be a component which has a capacity. In order for you to feel it better, I want you to imagine uh, a cliff. I want you to imagine that uh, this is one side of the cliff, let's call it side A, and I want you to see this side, side B. And this cliff, of, of course, there is a river, there is water coming in, and the height of this cliff is huge. So basically, people cannot just uh, move through the water and go to the uh, other side of the cliff. Now, a simple rule I want you to have in mind is this. If I have a visitor on 
side A and say that is a gentleman for every visitor I'm going to consider an opposing uh, component opposing uh, uh, basically uh, charge on the other side so if there is a gentleman who is coming in on this side I would like you to imagine that there is a loved one on the other side this could be a sister could be mother could be a girlfriend so basically uh, I'm asking you to remember that there is one person who is coming in and I'm going to represent this say by a positive charge and there is going to be another person coming in and this could be a negative charge so the rule is we come to this difficult uh, environment because news has spread to us that if you come in you might be able to see your sister you might be able to see your girlfriend or boyfriend or father or brother so basically there is an intention the intention is to see the opposing figure but a loved one okay now, as you can imagine, this cliff has a number of uh, properties. First, there is a physical geometry to this side of the cliff as well as this side of the cliff. This physical geometry forces us to accommodate only a limited number of people. Perhaps there is a metal fence protecting people not to fall off the side of the cliff. The second thing I would like you to imagine is the components that are inside, in between A and B. So this is a water, this is a huge cliff, and the distance also is going to be an important parameter. We would like to discuss that later. So when you take a look at this, I want you to consider all these elements, all these scenarios. Now, um, let's say the number of people who come in to the side of A or B is called charge. So I'm going to say that Q or the number of people have come in to one end. I know that there are, if there are 10 of these, there are going to be 10 of these on this side. So in total, I'm going to call it Q. I want to draw your attention to the other side of, the, uh, of this attention, this scenario. When I want to come to the side of A in order to see my sister, I have a huge interest in me. I'm going to call this the love of seeing your uh, sister. This fire is burning in my heart and I'm trying to see my uh, long time sister the interest in me that is accumulated as I get in actually it's going to be more and more and more because it's I'm excited to see my sister I'm going to call that voltage now voltage we have defined that before when you had a resistor voltage would have been the amount of energy a person needs to actually move from part A, point A, to point B. It's still the same definition is true, but I want you to have a different perspective for you presented today. The amount of interest that this person has to see the uh, loved one, I'm going to call that the voltage. Just for the sake of my uh, argument, because I'm going to tell you what is the component law. Now, if the voltage goes up, so I want to see the relationship between the charge, the number of people who come in at the two sides of the cliff, and the interest that they have inside. If the interest is so big, so huge, what am I going to do? I'm going to be so excited and I'm going to pick up my smartphone and I'm going to call my relatives and all other people that I know in the village. And I'm going to ask them, hey, come over. Sarah is on the side of the uh, cliff and we can see her. So I'm going to actually call the people and relatives in the village and ask them to come in. I'm going to ask more and more charge to come in. If the interest in me is so huge, I would expect that the number of people who come to visit would go up. So a simple relationship is this. If V is going up, 
I expect Q to go up as well. Now, how, who defines this relationship? How defines the number of people who come in to stand and watch the relative or the loved ones on the other side? Obviously, the capacity. So I'm going to say that there is a simple component that defines this relationship. Voltage and charge are related together by a simple factor called C, capacitor. In this class, C is constant and it doesn't change. But if you come and join us in electrical engineering in the fourth year, for example, C could change by temperature, by geometry, by time, by frequency, C would be a variable. But in this case, thanks God, C is a constant value from the beginning to the end. And it represents the capacity. The unit that is going to express C for me is called Farad. Farad F and basically um, is coming from the name of the, one of the scientists who contributed a lot to this domain. So I could say one farad. One farad is really too big. One, when I say I have a capacitor of one farad, it would be as big as this engineering building we are in right now. So typically we talk about microfarad, nanofarad, picofarad. Micro is 10 minus six, uh, nano is 10 minus nine, pico is 10 minus uh, 12, and also femto and so on. So this is a big unit well, and usually we have uh, a fraction of it uh, basically discussed inside the classrooms. This is a component law which relates the charge and the voltage. If you remember back in chapter one, we said dq to dt is going to be my i. The reason I would like to enforce this on the relationship I just discussed is that when I talked about resistor, I said give me I and V. When I talk about voltage, I said assign me a voltage and a current directions. When I talk about current, I always focus on I and V. I would like to be able to present this scenario using I and V, not Q and V. Of course, Q and V is going to remain helpful for the entire session but I would like to have I and V enforced upon the capacitor. So let's put that in. I'm going to have derivative of CV to DT. Again, if we are in this class, C is going to be constant. If you are in the fourth year electrical engineering, that's a different story. Because C is constant, I'm going to take it out. So it's going to be C DV to DT. So it's going to be the derivative of the voltage that defines what my I is. As the, uh, as the uh, uh, voltage variations exist, then there would be more current. The reason is this, obviously, uh, let, let's take a look at this scenario and see what happens. There are two different scenarios I would like you to focus on. One scenario is this. The people in the village come in, come in, come in, and since there is a break between the two sides of the cliff, they can go to the other side. So what do you think is going to happen? Eventually, the capacitor is going to take as many as it can people who come in on side A and side B. So what happens is that the capacitor is going to take all it can and it stops taking anymore. So people come in, come in, come in, and this becomes saturated. If it is, then nothing happens. You don't see movement from the village to this. You don't see movement from here to this. You don't see movement from this side. Everybody stops. The entire scenario stops. That's when the uh, basically, uh, the, the charge exists, but the current is going to be zero. You don't see more movement of people anymore. So, if the voltage is DC, if I enforce um, uh, direct, well, DC, what I mean is, uh, DC means it's not fluctuating. It means it's just a constant. If the voltage is constant, capacitor tends to charge, but as it charges to the end of it, everything is going to stop. 
the current is going to be zero. How can I identify this? If V is five volts, derivative of five volts in respect to time is going to be zero, and the current is going to be zero. That's the way I'm going to see. That village I just talked to you about is actually a voltage source, or perhaps a current source. The village is the source of energy for me, the source of electrons and positrons that come in. So far, what did we talk about? We talked about a very important equation which rules the component, and then we took this component into IV relationship. Deriv derivative of V is going to be proportional uh, to I. Now, if I wanted to reflect that um, basically um, in terms of a schematic, usually we have the two sides in parallel. In this class, for the sake of simplicity, we assign a polarity, for example, this is going to be plus and minus. So I'm going to say this is V. And we also assign a current direction. So I'm going to say the current direction is uh, the same as going to the plus going through the component and leaving the negative sign. But that's not the true picture though. The capacitor is like a voltage source. The easiest capacitor you can imagine is actually a battery you buy, a car battery you have. If you happen, and I don't want you to do that actually, if you happen to be able to open up the car battery, you can see a slices of metal inside. So what happens, these slices of metal are going to be full of electrons and um, positrons, the charges that we need. And they are going to supply the rest of the system, right? So uh, if you remember back in chapter one, we said that the voltage source can have any current that comes in and leaves. The current direction is not tug, tagged into the voltage polarity. It's not glued into the voltage polarity. So I'm going to just say loosely, I can say current is actually going through plus to the component minus leaves the component. But that's not the true picture because there are cases where the current goes this way. But this is going to give us a coherent picture which often are going to, is going to help us to find and solve the system. That's why I want you to imagine this one. But now that I and V are not necessarily glued to each other, unlike the capacitor, uh, unlike the resistor. Resistor follows the Ohm law. If you give me the voltage polarity, the current is not yours. The current direction obeys the Ohm law. If you give me the current direction, the voltage polarity is not yours. It obeys the Ohm law. However, in, for a capacitor, you never know. The current could be the other way around. So I need you to keep that in mind. So what did we talk about so far? Q is equal to CV. I is equal to C dV to dt. Before I uh, go and talk about the physical geometry of the capacitor, I want to alert you to the energy stored inside a capacitor. An ideal capacitor, as I said, is not meant to dissipate any energy. If you remember back then, we had P as equal to V times I. This is true for any moment in time. So V, I have it. I, we just found it. C dV to dt, and uh, with the assumption that C is constant, so it's going to be C dV to dt. Uh, I'm sorry, C times V, C times V times dV to dt. If I wanted to find the energy, the energy would be the integration of P dt. So I need to multiply this by dt. You can see dt and dt is gone. And therefore, this would be, and therefore, this would be uh, C V D V. Now, C is constant in this class. It comes out C integration of V D V. And I can continue this. If I enforce limits to this, this one is going to be from T0 to a given T. Since my variable of interest now is voltage, Corresponding to T0, it's going to be V of T0 to V of T, correspondingly, so it's going to be V of T0 to V of T. V dV 
integration of VDV is a simple integration we already know from a high school is going to be C times half of um, uh, basically V2. And if you enforce the two limits, uh, you are going to get uh, equal to C V of T to the power of 2 divided by 2 minus C V of T0 to the power of 2 divided by 2. Let's assume that the capacitor has been resting and there is no charge and no, no energy stored and therefore there is no voltage. Let's assume it is overnight and my cliff is actually empty. Nobody is coming to the cliff to see each other. So basically in overnight the voltage is zero, no one has an interest and if this is zero this component can go and uh, leave us with the, with the outcome of 1 over 2 CV to the power of 2. That's the energy stored. As more voltage is applied, more energy is stored. It's like uh, a, 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 an explosive environment. The more excitation is, some of the people might actually have the interest to find a solution put a suspension bridge, do something to actually go from side A and side B. And it really actually happens. If you have a, have a capacitor and you raise the voltage so high, some of the electrons actually shoot from one plate to another. They actually really go and pass through the insulation that exists. It's called leakage current that happens on the capacitor. And that leakage current gets worse and worse and worse as the voltage goes up. So if the a voltage goes up, the energy stored in the device is going to go up by the power of two. I want you to come back again, and this time I want you to look at the physical geometry of this uh, component. So let me summarize. This is considering that the capacitor has been resting and therefore overnight there is no interest in that. That's going to be the energy stored in the component. Now side A, I'm going to model that by a plate. Similar plate you have seen in a car battery. Side B, at this time I'm going to assume it is the same geometry, same shape in advanced electronics the geometry may not be the same, the shape may not be the same, and elements might be different. But here in this class, there are two plates, side A and side B. And there is a distance between the two plates, and I'm going to call this distance D. Well, let me ask you this question. I have a component. The capacitivity of this component is of interest to me. If the area, the area, suppose the area of this uh, rectangle or a square uh, plate, if the area is more, do you think do I have more capacitivity to entertain more people, more electrons, more positrons? Yes. As A goes up, the area, as area goes up, I expect to be able to entertain more electrons that come to the plate. Now, as the distance comes to be shorter and shorter, what happens? If the distance is shorter, something interesting happens in the uh, virtual environment I talked to you about. If this is really a small, <clears throat> and people can actually have a stretch their hand over and at least shake the hand of the sister or girlfriend, the other side. If I can do that, then the news would go into the village, hey guys, not only you can see your loved one, but also you can actually shake hands. So although I have a limited space, people is come in, as scramble on top of each other, and actually you can see that I'm utilizing more and more of a space. Bef before, the people might be standing loosely on the area, but because there is a huge interest, and also I can actually shake hands with my sister, then people say, okay, let's, let's 
squeeze each other, let's take more space, let's see if we can basically see the loved ones. Because of that huge interest, you can feel that as the D comes down, the virtual capacity goes up because people come in and on shoulders of each other, on the side of each other, hey, let's shake hands. So that's what's going to happen. As the D goes down, I expect C to go up. And in this way, for my scenario, I'm going to call it a virtual capacity. So as D comes down, C goes up. The next thing you want to imagine is the infrastructure between the two sides of the cliff. The component that could exist between the two, two plates, plate one, plate two, plate A, plate B. Now, if you happen to have um, a wall in between, if there is a, a concrete wall in between, you can't do anything. You can't even watch your sister. So if there is a concrete wall, there is going to be, you know that your sister is on the other side of the wall. You know that much, but you don't see her. You don't shake hand with her. So what happens is that this concrete wall is going to diminish your interest. If there is a glass, at least you can see your sister, right? If there is water and this, the height of the water, the height of the cliff is small, some people might actually decide to go over the metal fence and since it might be safe to actually walk through the river to get to the sister. So depending on the infrastructure I have in between, it's going to define my capacity. Remember the capacity here is the news that goes and spreads in the village. So depending on that, I can say how much my capacity is. Epsilon is going to be a kind of indication of what the component, what the insulation is between the two plates. So formula is easy. First of all, it has direct, uh, it is directly proportional to the A, it is indirectly proportional to the D, and it has the component, the infrastructure in between the two plates that come in and identify my capacity. So capacitor is equal to epsilon A divided by D. Obviously, I want to have bigger A and a smaller D if I could, but there are challenges involved. Sometimes you don't want to have people actually go through the fence and basically move and basically endanger their life. So these are the things that come into uh, the design process, designing of this capacitor. So in one sense, capacitor tries to accommodate the charge and tries to bring in the number of people, the interest of the loved ones into the equation. <coughs> Remember the rule we said, and the rule is for every, every uh, person there is going to be a loved one. Now, let me put the capacitors into series combination. I have three capacitors. And this is going to be C1, depending on the size and distance and all that. C2, depending on insulations, and C3. This is point A, and this is point B. And obviously, the intention is to supply this with energy, perhaps with a current source, perhaps with a voltage source, and a combination of, uh, basically, components. OK? If you remember, we had a simple rule. The rule is for every person, there has to be an opposing figure on the other side. Now, initially, when there is no source attached to the design, the entire system is resting. If I look at any part of the design, the electron and positrons should neutralize each other. So if I ask you to go in and take a look at this part for me, this part. There is isolation, isolation, metal, wire, metal. So if this is in a resting mode, then 
the electron and positrons should neutralize each other. You can't have an additional charge here. Where is it coming from? This is an island. This is an island in an ocean uh, and basically isolated from the entire environment. So if you have a plus here, you must have a minus in order to neutralize this. That's the way it is. Now, I want to bring in a source. As I bring in the source, I'm going to bring in a plus. And if you remember the rule we talked about, and that is, for every plus you bring me, I'm going to give you a minus. So for this plus that you gave me here, I need to give you a minus. So this plus meets minus. But when you say I'm actually asking a minus to be here, initially it was in a neutralized environment. Where is the positive? The positive has to go and basically separate itself on this side. Plus minus, if you still look into this limited environment, you can see it's neutralized, except that now I have separated them. Who separated this? This plus is actually uh, creating a chain of event. This plus is going to bring in a minus. A plus goes on this side. Because of this plus, a minus come in on this side. A minus go in on this side. Because you had a neutralized environment in the first place, you need to have a plus on this side. Because of this again, you need to have a minus sign. And who is this minus side coming from? This is coming from this guy. A plus is gone this way, and a minus is gone this way. So that makes sense. Now, if you happen to have more of these positives, say you have three positive on this side, you definitely need to maintain equilibrium on these two sides of the uh, uh, universe, these, these components. So that's going to be minus, minus, um, plus, plus, and finally, minus, minus. How much charge do you have? How much charge do you have in this scenario? You gave in T plus. These existed inside. This capacitor, now I want you to ch ch shift your glasses, and I want you to take a look at this for me. This capacitor, this side. If you look at this capacitor, this capacitor has three positive on one side, three negative on the other side. This capacitor has three on one side, three on the other side. This capacitor has three on one side, three on the other side. The charge on this is the same as charge on this, is the same as charge on this. That's the conclusion I want to draw for this simple topology. Well, I made it crowded so that you can see one important conclusion. I want to erase this and go back to my original formation, please. So let me clean a bit. The same topology. I have C1. I have C2. I have C3. The conclusion we just gave you, and actually an obvious uh, conclusion of components in series. I'll tell you in a moment. Now, what is my voltage? Let's say this is plus minus V1. This is going to be plus minus V2. This is going to be plus minus V3. If you remember, there was supposed to be an I coming in. I1 is the same as I2 is the same as I3. Remember, I is dq1 to dt. Therefore, I1 dq1 to dt. I2 dq2 to dt. I3 dq3 to dt. They are supposed to be the same because these three components are in series. And the current of series component is going to be the same. So that's not a surprise. But I want you to see the uh, issue in another way. I'm going to call this Q total. The Q total actually is supplied by the source. Q total or Q1 is equal to C1 V1. That's the law we talked about, right? Q total is equal to Q2 is equal to C2 V2. 
Q total is equal to Q3 is equal to C3 V3. So far so good? Now if you remember one of the things we discussed when we had resistors in series on parallel was to say engineer would like to shrink this entire design into one capacitor. I want to be able to replace these capacitors into one capacitor called C total and applying the same voltage and providing the same charge. So if I apply and if I provide the same charge, remember you had three charges on this and you had three charges on this. If you remember from the previous discussions we had, this charge, I want this to be the same as I had it in the previous structure. I want QT to be the same as QT. CT, I want to be representing all three components and the voltage is going to be VT. If this is E, let's see how V's and the E are going to relate. My intention is to be able to replace this with this one. In the uh, top one, if you write a KVL law, your KVL law is going to be minus E plus V1 plus V2 plus V3 as equal to zero. It's obvious that you're saying V1 plus V2 plus V3 as equal to E. That's very obvious. If you apply KVL on this uh, system, you're going to get minus E minus E plus Vt as equal to zero. Okay, or you can say that simply Vt is equal to E. You want the two structures to behave the same from external point of view. Let's put V1 from here, V2, V3, extract them, put them here, and let's get the Vt out of this center. Remember this one? This one is going to be QT as equal to CT times VT. That's what the capacitor law is. Let's put that in and see what happens. Okay. V1 is Q1 divided by C1. V2 is Q2 divided by C2. V3 is Q3 divided by C3 as equal to E. At the same time, E is equal to Vt. At the same time, Vt is equal to Qt divided by Ct. Assuming that the charge is not zero, you can actually get this out. And therefore, 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3 as equal to 1 over Ct. It's a very interesting conclusion. If you remember, when we had resistors in series, we would have added them. But in time domain, capacitors in series, you need to inverse it. It seems as if you are following the G rule for resistors. You are inversing C1, inversing C2, and inversing C3 in order to get the inverse of CT. Remember the final inverse of CT. So if I have capacitors in series, I would need to follow the inverse rule on the component value. And this is, of course, true for time domain analysis. The next time when we take this in chapter 9 to frequency domain, you'll be surprised how it's actually going to react. At that time, we revisit this issue, but this is correct in the time domain at this time. Okay, so that's one possible structure. I want to put the three capacitors now into parallel mode and see if I can get um, uh, the equation, the equivalent capacitor out of this. So let me erase this. And at the same time, I want you to think. If you have three capacitors in parallel, what does it mean? If you have three barrels of oil, what does it mean? How much oil do you have? Well, you are going to say, I have oil for barrel one, I have oil for barrel two, I have oil for barrel three. You sum them up. So it's going to be, 
I'm going to have capacitor number one, capacitor number two. By the way, the proof we just offered you is not the same as the textbook, both these proof. So you may wish to uh, listen to us carefully and follow consistently about the rules and laws of the component. Now, for these components I have, I know if the components are in parallel, the voltages are going to be the same. So E is going to be the same as E. It's going to be the same as E. It's going to be the same as E. I know that part. <coughs> Now, speaking of charge, imagine you have 10 people coming in. That's charge, right? 10 people coming in, two people go and sit on plate number one, five people go and sit on plate number two. My question is, how many people go and sit on plate number three? You have 10 people coming in, two sits on one, five on two, and obviously three is left. How did you get it? Because you said there is a law. I can't create more people and I can't destroy them. So basically people come in and you're going to have Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3, the same as the Q total. So if this is, this is the charge that is coming in, you know the KCL law anyway. Let me actually write it down in terms of charge, in, t in terms of uh, current, in terms of charge obviously, if I have uh, for example, uh, five charge coming in, uh, five, if I have one here, if I have two here, I'm going to conclude I have three on this side. Uh, actually, how much? No, I'm sorry. I'm going to conclude I have two on this side because it's supposed to be two plus two plus one is the same as five. IT is equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3. That's the case here now. So, Q total, Q total is equal to Q1 sitting on plate one, Q2 sitting on plate two, Q3 sitting on plate three. That makes sense. Now, another side that an engineer wants to do is this. Why don't we remove all of this from internal, I don't care, from external, I want to have the same behavior. So I want to replace this, the external is E, I want to replace this three capacitor with one capacitor. I'm going to call this CT. Obviously, the charge, I'm going to have the same charge going in, the same charge actually I'm going to sit on the plate, and the voltage obviously, because this is facing E in parallel, the voltage is going to be the same as E. And the rule that covers this one is QT is equal to CT VT, Q1 is equal to C1 V1, Q2 is equal to C2 V2, and Q3 is equal to C3 V3. I know V1, V2, V3 would be VT, so let's replace it. QT is CT VT. Q1 is C1 V1. Q2 is C2 V2. Q3 is C3 V3. If I assume that the Voltages are not zero. This one is not zero. I can actually get rid of this. And therefore, CT is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. That makes sense. In order to increase the capacity of the design, you better put them in parallel. You better put the barrels of oil in parallel. And that's the way you are going to have them uh, have more and more storage capacity. If the capacitors are in parallel, unlike the resistors in parallel, the value is going to be the summation of all. This is more or so similar to resistors in series. Again, this concept is in time domain. When we get into frequency domain, we are going to show you that this is correct, but in a different light. So if capacitors are in parallel, I sum them up and I get my CT out of the process. 
I'm going to go and eventually get you some examples. But here is the challenge when we move to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is talking about resistors and one capacitor. Resistors and one inductor. The idea is this. If you have more than one capacitor, can you shrink them to make one capacitor? If you have three capacitors in parallel, obviously you can take them down and replace it with one. If you have three capacitors in series, you can replace it with one. As long as you can replace the existing capacitors into one capacitor, we are talking about chapter seven, where we are going to talk about first degree designs, and it would be RC. Just to alert you about first degree, I have R, I have C1, and I have C2. Is this first degree? Of course it is, C1 and C2. We are going to combine them, and there would be one capacitor only. So one capacitor only and resistors, that's one RC. But I want you to also imagine the next possibility. What if there is a resistor in between? So that's R, that's C1, but unfortunately that's Rx, and then C2. Is this first degree, or do you have only one capacitor? No, because you cannot shrink C1 and C2 into one capacitor. You cannot do that. Therefore, this is a second degree design. We will be talking about second degree design in chapter nine, but on the infrequency domain for this class, because analysis of second degree designs are really uh, heavy. Uh, for every degree of complexity, you're adding to degree of differential equation. If your design is 10th degree, then you are going to have a differential equation of the magnitude of 10, which is a huge task to resolve. So chapter seven we are moving in is all about first degree design where you could shrink all the capacitors into one capacitor. Before I begin chapter seven, I would like to refresh your memory about the signals and the way they are manifesting in reality in circuit design. When you come into lab number four, you are going to see pulses from gen uh, gen uh, signal generators. A square waveforms, you can see triangular waveforms, you can see a sine cosine waveforms, but a square waveforms that would be what we are going to discuss now. But a simpler form of a square waveform is a step function. Here is my vertical axis, horizontal axis. This is in time domain. This is the function of t. And I want you to remember one of the important function you had. It's called unity function. It's zero, then at zero it's going to jump, and then it's going to remain one. This is u of t. u of t has the following property. It is zero. For t less than zero, it is one. For t greater than zero, and obviously there is variety of points raised for t exactly equal to zero. Some textbooks said it is zero, some textbooks said it is one, and some textbooks said it is half. We really don't mind to actually say one. It's, we are not really as much interested in the moment in time. What we are going to be interested in is the moment after or before that huge change, drastic change. If this is zero second, I want you to zoom in to this point right after zero. You need to put a huge microscope to see what I'm trying to say. The point right after zero, I'm going to call it zero plus. Zero plus is equal to zero plus epsilon. And epsilon is 10 to the power of 10 billion. It's really small. It really doesn't exist in that sense. Zero plus is equal to zero plus epsilon just exactly right after zero, 
I'm going to note it as zero plus. Also, I want you to actually have this point right before zero, I'm going to say zero minus. Zero minus is the actual zero minus the same smallest number that exists in the universe. Zero minus epsilon, that's going to be zero minus. So I'm going to say it is zero until zero minus. It is one from zero plus and afterward. Also, I want to refresh your memory about how u of t is plotted and understood. When you take a look at the mathematical representation of this function, you can see that inside the bracket is the decisive uh, condition for the uh, values of the function. Inside the bracket is going to tell me where is 0 and when is going to be 1. Now, if I ask you to tell me how much, a, how would you say this one is? How can you plot this? The first thing you need to do is this. Pick up your bracket. 10 minus 1 is inside the bracket. If 10 minus 1 is less than 0, you got 0. If t minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, you've got 1. That's the way you do it. So it's going to be 10 less than 1, it's 0. 10 greater than 1 is going to be 1. If you want to plug this now, you can see there is a shift in time that is happening. This is a critical point. The critical point now is 1. At this 1, I'm supposed to witness a drastic change. t less than 1, I'm supposed to have 0. t greater than 1, I'm supposed to have 1. This is one second, and the value obviously is going to be one volts or one amp. Right now, we don't assign any unit to it. Whenever you have a graph, remember engineers, whenever you have a graph, you need to have a unit for x-axis, and you need to have a unit for y-axis. In this case, my x-axis is t, and it is in second, and y-axis at the moment, I didn't consider a voltage or a current, but sometimes it's a voltage, sometimes it's a current, okay? Now, if I ask you to tell me how much u of uh, uh, basically t plus 8 is, how much u of t plus 8 is, and how would you plot this? Once again, you focus on the bracket itself. You say the bracket is t plus 8, t plus 8 less than 0, it's 0. t plus 8 more than or equal to 0, that's 1. That's what the u of t was in the first place, inside the bracket. You zoom in up to the inside the bracket. Now, if you take a look at t plus 8 less than 0, it's t less than minus 8. t plus 8 greater than 0 is t greater than minus 8. My critical point in time is minus 8. So if I wanted to plot this, this is t. My critical point is minus 8. There is going to be a drastic change. Which way? 1 to 0 or 0 to 1? For t less than minus 8, minus 9, minus 10, minus 11, I'm supposed to have 0. So that's the way it's going to be. For t greater than minus 8, I'm supposed to jump up and become 1. I'm not done. I want to see, I want to show you something else. Because often people come and ask me, especially for the assignment, assigned problems, that what, can, can we escape u of 2t or u of minus t? These are confusing me. Please listen to me. If you listen to me, there is no reason for you to be confused. Take a look. Let me give you another possibility. <coughs> Okay. Okay, now, u of minus t plus 5. How do you plot this? Again, I don't have to be afraid of u of t. Inside bracket, minus t plus 5, less than 0. Minus t plus 5, greater than or equal to 0. For this, I'm going to get 0. For this, I'm going to get 1. That's the way u of t was defined in the first place. So take a look. You take t to the other end, t greater than 5. You take t to the other end, t less than or equal to 5. That tells me how the shape is. 
So here's my function. Okay, and this is f of t. t is equal to 5 is my critical point. This is t is equal to 5. How am I going to go? Is it 1 to 0 or is it one, 0 to 1? For t less than 5, I'm supposed to get 1. That's the way it is. That's 1. For t greater than 5, I'm supposed to come down and become 0. This is u of minus t plus 5. Regardless of what is inside the bracket, you don't have to be afraid of it. You simply say u of whatever it is, that whatever it is inside the bracket. Less than 0, it's 0. Greater than 0, it's 1. And then you do a bit of a simplification, tells you what is the critical point and how the change is going to happen. There is a drastic change that is happening in this scenario. Before I move in and talk about RC, now that we talk about drastic change, do you remember my I as equal to C dV to dt? That was the component law, where you would have relationship between I and V of a capacitor. My question to you is this. Can I have a drastic change on V? Doesn't matter how much, how drastic it is. For example, it is zero, and then a very small amount, and then it's going to be, say, picovolts. I'm going to just tell you what I mean. This is picovolts. Picovolts means 10 to the power of minus 12 volts, right? This is zero and 10 minus 12 volts, really small, but there's a drastic change. You need to tell me what happens to my derivative. In terms of zero, if you take a derivative of this in respect to t, obviously that's zero. In respect to derivative of v in respect to t, of course this flat line is going to give you zero. How about this moment? What happens in that moment? You have a drastic change. A small, really small, 10 to the power of minus 200 billion, if you want to say. Very small change you have. What is the derivative of this point in terms of time? This is going to be a spike. So it's going to be zero. It's going to be zero. And then for this moment, suddenly it goes to infinity. The derivative of this edge is infinity and then comes back. Derivative of v for this moment is going to be infinity. And infinity times c is going to be infinity. How can your real design supply infinity as the current? Because the current cannot be infinity. In this class, again, we emphasize, because we have made it so simple, assumptions are very easy um, to follow, in a DC design, in a DC design, V would like V to be smooth. We don't want this to change like this. We don't want to see any drastic change. We don't want to see a sign and then change and then a sign. No. Of course this is a smooth derivative, a smooth derivative, but this is the one which is going to give me headache. I'm going to lose a sleep over this. Because if this happens on a network, city network, then you are actually demanding a huge current from the network. And that huge current cannot be supplied. Therefore, we are going to make a simple assumption. Drastic change on the voltage of a capacitor, just a voltage, remember? Just a voltage is not desirable. in this class. Again, there are applications when we intentionally look into these scenarios, and I don't want to uh, drag you into that, but I want you to remember in this class, chapter seven, drastic change on the voltage of a capacitor is definitely not desirable. We don't want to have drastic change. Drastic change means sharp change. So what do I mean by this simple rule? I mean that the voltage of a capacitor is supposed to be smooth. Well, you have a capacitor, 9 volts. You put it into the, uh, your device and you charge the car battery, right? The car battery is charged. 
Then you want to take off the car battery from the network that is charging and then take it to your car and install it. If, 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 if you see, I'm saying that the car battery is supposed to be charged. If it is charged, then the current has a stop. Remember, if the two sides of the plates are saturated, there is no more movement. There is no DC movements. So basically, there is no current. You cut this one and you take it to the next one. It makes sense because you took the current to zero and then you put it to the next. The voltage is going to remain 12 volts for the car battery. You can't have 12 volts change to 14 volts. If it happens, you have a drastic sinking or sourcing of the current. So that's what I need you to remember in this scenario. Okay. Let's go into chapter seven. What I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, first prove mathematically what we mean by uh, the uh, equations involved. And then as I have done so far, I'm going to go and say from engineering point of view, how can we simplify this? How can we look at this in a robotic sense? Of course, if I wanted to see the proof, I can always refer to it. But aside from the proof, how can I basically uh, adjust myself to the reality. What is my question? You have a simple design, R, and you have a capacitor in, and you have a DC voltage coming in. Okay, that's going to be E, R, and C. Let's go back to Chapter one, chapter two, you see, chapter one, chapter two are really fundamental and they apply themselves to the entire uh, concept we talk about. Well, for every component, you're supposed to have a current and a voltage. For this, I'm going to say I have a current called IT. For this, I'm going to say this is going to be VR and I'm going to call this IR. These two follow the Ohm law, remember? For this, of course, I don't have an ohm law to follow, but I want to say this is VC, and I want to follow this as IC, for simplicity reason. Then, if you remember, we would go and identify the number of nodes. You have one node at the bottom of the design. You typically, the bottom of the design, which is, uh, in this case, connected to a negative pin, we are going to ground this. This is going to be uh, node A, and this is going to be node B, right? I have three nodes. I'm going to have this as a reference node. Okay. Now I have node A and B. I have KCL law to write. This is topology law. Then I have VR and VC and E. I have one single loop. I need to write KVL law, topology law. Then I have Ohm law for this and we just uh, followed a very beautiful uh, formula for the relationship between voltage and current of a capacitor. That's another component law. I need to write the uh, uh, topology law, KCL. For node A minus IT plus IR is equal to zero. IT is entering, that's negative. IR is leaving, that's positive, as equal to zero. For node B, IR is entering the node and IC is leaving the node as equal to zero. That's my KCL law. Let's do KVL law. You have only one loop, and therefore we expect to have only one equation for that. Let's begin from this point. It's going to be minus E plus VR plus VC as equal to zero. Then have the component law. Component law. Then what do we have? It's going to be uh, for the resistor, that is uh, Ohm law, it says VR is equal to R times IR. For capacitor, I have IC as equal to C dVC to dT. Let's begin simplifying this design. How many unknowns do you have? If you remember the, play, the game we played, one, two, three, four, five, you need five equations. You do have five equations. Let's begin solving this. This one, IT goes to the other end. IT is equal to IR. 
This one, IR goes to the other end. IR is equal to IC. And the conclusion here is IR, IC, uh, I'm sorry, this is IT. IR, IC, and IT are the same. It makes sense. If you remember, we had a simple rule. If everything is inside a loop, if everything is in, in, considered to be connected in series, then obviously the currents of all components are going to be the same. So I'm going to say that all the currents are the same. And since my differential equation eventually is going to concentrate on the C, I'm going to say this is IC. This is IC. Everything is IC. That's what it says. IC is equal to the rest. If that's the case, let's simplify this one. VR is going to be RIC. This one, of course, is this, nothing is going to change. Let's put this in. Let's put this into this equation. Minus E plus VR is RIC plus VC as equal to zero. Let's put IC from the component law of the capacitor. Minus E plus RIC C DVC to DT plus VC as equal to zero. Take a look. One equation. I have one unknown. E, R, C, everything is known except VC. It is not known. But I also notice that this is a first degree differential equation. D to DT exists. Unlike a pure resistive network, I'm going to see a D to DT in the design. I'm going to erase this and I'm going to see how we can basically find the solution for this part. Okay, so I'm going to say, take this term to the other end, minus E plus VC as equal to minus RC dVC to dT. Um, the index C is bugging me, this index C, this index. For simplicity reason, I want to remove that index C. But although I say V, I really mean the voltage of the capacitor. So just for the simplicity reason, I'm going to say V minus E, this is the voltage of a capacitor, is minus RC dV to dT. I need you to take this to the denominator of that and everything else to this side. So it's going to be minus one over RC dT. This goes down, minus minus, dT comes up as equal to dV divided by V minus E. I have T on this side all the time, and I have V on this side all the time, and I'm ready to take integrations of both sides. I'm going to take integration of this, and I'm going to take integration of this. But I have to note, at the same time, the variable that is inside the integration. This is dt. And therefore, when I say dt, I mean you need to focus from t0 to t. These two limits have to correspond with this variable. If I have v, I need to have v and v. But of course, these have to be the same. These have to be uh, referring to the same point. So if this is t0, I mean v of t0. If this is t, I mean v of t. So remember, if this is dv, your limits should be v corresponding to the limits you had in time domain. Let's go and solve this again. Assumption is R is constant, C is constant. Minus, one, minus is not going to deter you. So it's minus one over RC, integration of dt. The limit is t0 to t. And this one is going to be, well, integration of vt0, vt, dv, divided by V minus E. Remember, V is actually VC for us, voltage of the capacitor. We simply remove the C so that we have a neat, neat uh, uh, equation to follow. OK. So 
What's the integration of dt? The integration of dt is t. And then you apply the two limits. Minus 1 over rc. You have t. Then it's going to be t0 to t as equal to. What's the integration of dv over v? It's ln, logarithmic. So it's going to be ln of v minus e. e is known. The two limits would be v of t0 and then v of t. Again, we are trying to prove this. Some of you may say this is boring. But you remember, as an engineer, you are supposed to know the basic of the product. Because your mind is supposed to be critical. You are supposed to have a good critical analysis. You are supposed to be inventive when you go out in the industry later. So that's why we give you the proof. But at time, when we get to the end, I'm going to give you some simple rules and steps to follow. This one, minus 1 over RC. T, the limit T applied. T, the limit T0 applied. Ln. V, the limit VT applied. Ln. V, the limit of T0 applied. That's nice. This one is familiar to us. Ln minus Ln is Ln of division. So this one is going to be Ln of Vt minus E divided by Vt0 minus E minus 1 over Rc T minus T0. Ln, you can get rid of Ln by actually applying the inverse function, and that would be to inverse both sides. This is going to bring us to the exponential. So this is going to be e to the power of minus t minus t0 divided by rc as equal to v of t minus e divided by v of t0 minus e. Again, my short of a space. And I need to actually erase this part to continue this. It's really a very beautiful function. I'm going to translate this into both steps and graph. And you will see that in lab number four. So I need a space. Let's take this off. OK. Well, let's cross multiply both sides and see what happens. This is vt minus e as equal to v of t0 minus e e to the power of minus t minus t0 divided by rc. e goes to the other end, e plus v of t0 minus e e to the power of minus Allow me to put the bracket in. Please put the bracket in because this minus sign is sometime heavy and we don't remember to put that in. This is the final conclusion. How do I justify? How does it look in time domain? We are going to discuss that. And how can I get this far without actually going through the tedious process of steps, mathematical steps? This is t, this is vt, t is in second, vt is in volt, for example. Let's assume vt of 0. vt of 0 means the voltage of a capacitor at a given time, t0. If t0 is, ha is going to be 0 plus, if you replace this t0 with the time 0 plus, let's see what happens. V of t is equal to E minus, just a special case. Generally speaking, a special case. It's going to be V plus V of 0 plus minus E times E to the power of minus T minus 0 plus. T minus 0 plus is T anyway. So it's minus T divided by RC. This is a special case. If V of 0 plus is 0, Remember, the design has been in the lab. 
and all the power stations have been off. It was overnight, everything is discharged. You come in, you turn on the light, and you push the power button, and then see what happens. Initially, the capacitor is discharged. Overnight, nobody goes onto the cliff to see the loved ones. Overnight, the capacitor is empty. So if this is empty, at t is equal to zero plus, I'm going to start from zero. At t goes to infinity, what happens? t goes to infinity, minus infinity divided by something, e to the power of minus infinity, it's zero. Zero times this bracket is zero. What is left is e. So graphically, the shape of this is going to be like this. For this a special case, I say. So the value here is going to be e. It starts from initial condition and eventually ends and stabilizes itself around the final value e. That's what the mathematics tell me. Take a look at this and tell me what happens. If you remember, we said that the cliff eventually is going to absorb, absorb, absorb the number of people and eventually it's going to saturate. As it saturates, no more movement you see. There is no more people interested to come. There is no place to come. So what happens is that as you let this system go for a long time, the current goes in and eventually saturates the capacitor. And it saturates with all the might. This current is going to be zero. There is no movement from the village to the cliff because people know through the cell phone that there is no more space left. If the current is zero, let's write a KVL law in our mind and see what happens. It's going to be minus E plus R I R. You said this is zero, right? Plus V C as equal to zero. So if this is zero, E goes to the other end, V C is going to be E. Wow. This is the final value, the final voltage that I have on the capacitor. E is the steady state response in this case is the ultimate response, is the, um, basically um, uh, the, 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 the maximum it can reach in this case. So this one is going to be a steady state response. A steady state meaning what happens if I let it go for a long time and let the system stabilize. In this case, the system has stabilized, the current is zero and the voltage is going to be E. What is this part? You have an element of T inside, which means for t is zero something, t is equal to one millisecond something, two millisecond something, and obviously it's changing. So it's going to be boom, 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 going up to this. This is what happens to the steady state. This is the area of almost a steady state. I say a steady state almost because you really need to stay mathematically into infinity to see this exactly adding to E. But this part, you see this segment, this segment actually, you can see this. This is called transient. Transient response. It's in motion. This one is called transient response. Transient, because it is changing. I can imagine that in my RC that I showed you on the table, when I let it go for a long time, engineers don't have patience for infinity. Engineers define what infinity is. If one second is important to me, 10 times one second is infinity. The rule is 10. If I want to have one year, infinity means 10 years. If I have one millisecond, infinity means 10 millisecond. So that's the simple rule. If I let it go for a long time, capacitor stops taking more charge. The current stops and the voltage of a capacitor reaches the, 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 the E. In order for you to feel this better, I want you to translate capacitor stops taking charge into a schematic. When you say capacitor stops taking charge, this is what happens. In a DC design, 
DC means that the incoming voltage is a DC value, direct value. It's not fluctuating. It's 5 volts, 10 volts, something like that. In a DC scenario, of course, I'm going to talk about E in a moment because E is not just pure 5. E is a voltage inside the lab where it was 0 and then you push the power button and it became 5. That's what E is. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But generally speaking, I let the design go. I push the button in. I let the design stabilize. Incoming voltage is 5 volts DC. And I let it go. Capacitor stops taking it. In a long time, a capacitor acts like an open line. Simple rule. And we are going to see how the simple rule is going to actually make our life so much easier to write the equations for. Once again, this is my original equation. This is my original equation. I have a steady state response and I have transient response. Let's go back once again and take a look at this equation one more time before I give you a few steps as how to handle this. Okay. I need you to grab E together and I need you to grab VT on the other side. So this is VT. This is E minus, so it's going to be E times 1 minus E to the power of minus T minus T0 divided by RC. Okay, okay. I just took these two, right? Remember, it has a coefficient with a minus sign. That's what it is. And then I have this one. V of T0, I'm sorry, T0 e to the power of minus come on guys you need to be able to see what i'm trying to do i'm separating these two terms and i'm trying to put a human face on it i'm trying to tell you what each element mean to us i took e minus e this that vt this this why let's go back to my original design one more time Again, here is a pure mathematical equation, and I'm trying to understand little by little. This is the job of an engineer. Engineer tries to make sense out of equation. If my initial voltage on the capacitor is zero, there is no voltage on the capacitor when you come into the lab, say. This is zero. It doesn't exist at all. There is no contribution of the initial voltage in the entire equation. It is only responding to E. This is called input excitation response. You need to put input excitation response. You need to excite the design by an external component that is called E. This component, this area, is external excitation. You put an external component, a voltage source, and you see how the system responds. Imagine E is zero this time. When E is zero, if you remember from chapter one or two we talked about, a voltage source that is zero is actually like a short line. So if E is zero, this is going to be like a short line. If E is zero, this one doesn't exist, and you only have initial condition on the capacitor that is going to respond. And obviously that was my design. This was my entire design. This was inside my box. There was an external force, but this was inside my design. This is called natural response. Natural response because it happens internally. It happens with the existing material and component and food inside the design. That's why it's called natural response. But do you need to memorize this? No, you don't have to memorize any of these. You just need to listen to me, and each, uh, each time I'm going to grab this and talk to you about. So I could actually see this equation on two different lines. A steady state, transient, external input excitation, and internal natural response. I haven't talked about a very important element, and that is RC. What is RC? 
are seen in this course and in this domain is called time constant. Why is it called time constant? Let's go back again into my original design and see what happens. This is E. Okay, I need to clean this up. But this time, from all part of the equation, I want you to focus on the um, RC. Okay. If RC is bigger, suppose, for example, R is big, which means here is the village, village E, and here is my cliff, and people are actually going and trying to get to that so that they can see the loved ones. So far, so good? But from the village to the cliff, the road is extremely narrow, filled with rocks, and dangerous. Obviously, it's not as fast as you would have imagined. The people who want to leave the village actually have to be very careful. They need to go slowly toward the capacitor, toward the cliff. It takes longer time to charge the capacitor to the same value. If R is very small, say you pick up the people from the village on a, on a plane and you just go to the cliff. As simple as that. It's going to be a lot faster because play, it's fast. So RC is called time constant and the more the tau is, the longer it takes to get to the final output. The more the tau is, this is my tau. The more the tau is, the transient response is going to be slow responding. As the more the tau is, it reaches E, of course it does, but it takes a long time to reach E. This is longer tau. If my tau is smaller, then obviously I'm going to reach my response relatively fast. This is a smaller tau, a smaller tau, compared to the red one. This is the bigger tau compared to the red one. The larger the tau is, the slower it takes. The smaller the tau is, the faster it takes to reach the point. Some of you who are in mechanical engineering, or even aerospace, or even some other disciplines, you are going to talk about these elements. Are you overshooting in a second degree? Undershooting? Damping? What is your damping factor? These are the things that you are going to see later. Possibly you have seen it already. So what did we do? We went through the proof, we came to this equation, and we just took these equations into pieces and say, okay, this is what it means, this is what it means. In a different light, this is going to be external excitation, this is going to be internal excitation, and what is the tau? That's what we did in terms of analysis of the equation. I want to go back, and this time, I want to show you how to actually come with this equation without writing um, the heavy steps of math. How can I do that? Well, this, the equation is ra rather simple. This E, what was E? I said, let the system go in the infinity, and as the infinity happens, the charge is going to, the current is going to be zero, and therefore the voltage across this capacitor is going to be the same as E. You remember that? I'm going to actually show it on the equation. This is called V of infinity. And in order for me to find V infinity, as I said, for first degree, DC input, DC input, when you get to the final exam, DC input, when I get to the element of DC input, and I let it go for a long time, I'm going to open the capacitor, because capacitor is going to saturate and it's going to stop taking any more charges. It's going to be an open line. As it becomes an open line, the system becomes pure resistive. Tell me how much the voltage of infinity is. That's this guy. Okay, let's begin. This E is still here, so this is going to be V of infinity. This is the initial condition. 
You told me how much the voltage on the capacitor is in the first place. Either you told me that the capacitor has been discharged to zero, or you told me that there is a voltage on it. So I'm going to say V of zero plus e to the power of minus t minus zero plus. Of course, you don't have to write zero plus. This could be t, this could be t, but I'm just trying to follow the steps and RC. Actually, those of you who took the differential equation last term, I believe, I think you took that last term, or perhaps last year, you know that the answer to the first degree differential equation, whether it's a voltage or a current or anything else, as long as it's uh, in a DC environment, first degree scenario, is going to be V of infinity. Uh, let me write it down. Y of t, if this is voltage or current, I'm going to write it down in a general sense, is equal to e, Y of infinity plus Y of zero plus or T zero plus, I simplified this Z, T zero already, minus Y of infinity e to the power of minus t minus t zero plus divided by rc. What are my, how many unknowns do you have in this equation? How many? You have y of infinity, one. You have y of zero plus, two. You have rc, three. You just need to tell me what these three are. You don't have to suffer the steps we just discussed, okay? Let me give you a few examples before I actually lay out very nicely for you a step-by-step -step algorithm to do this. Let's begin and consider a scenario. Example number one. Okay. I'm going to keep this as the model I have in mind. Example number one. Capacitor might be frightening at first, but it doesn't have to be from the angle I'm going to explain to you. Because whatever you learn before the midterm is actually going to be instrumental for you to find. The question is simple. I need you to tell me how much this voltage is. VC. And I need you to give it to me in time domain. I'm going to tell you that VC of zero plus is going to be two volts, zero volts, two volts, whatever the initial condition is. Okay, you already know this component. It's already given to you, this one. The next point is Y of infinity. Y of infinity, how do you find this? In order for you to find VC of infinity, you need to actually open this because Whatever interactions happen, eventually this capacitor is going to be charged properly to its limit. To whatever it can be charged, it is going to charge. And therefore, this current, that is IC, is going to be zero. The current is going to stop. No more charge goes into that. If that's the case, how is my topology for infinity? My topology for infinity is as if this one doesn't exist. But you remember, VC is the same as this, right? Because they are in parallel, agreed? You remember, v capacitor and uh, resistor are two, very in parallel. So the question is, how much VC of infinity? It's simple. You have two resistors in front of a voltage source and you do a voltage division, and therefore VC of infinity is going to be R2 divided by R1 plus R2 times E. Let's go back to, me, to the circuit we talked about uh, where we found uh, the, uh, uh, the actual formulation. So this is C, this is R, right? Uh-huh. How do you find RC in the first place? RC means C, of course remember it was supposed to be first degree, which means all the capacitors are actually coming into one capacitor. So this C is C total. So if you happen to have two capacitors in parallel, it really doesn't matter. You just sum them up and you get your CT. 
So CT is fine. Where is my R? I, in order for me to find tau, I need you to stand across the capacitor. Put this capacitor behind. So I want you to see it like this. I want you to tell me how much capacitor sees in front of itself. So you are here now. You are standing here and you are actually looking at the design, this end. Your question is, how much is R equivalent? So what did you do? You shut down E to zero. That's the way we did it. Remember chapter four? In chapter four, we said you shut down E to zero. When you shut down E to zero, that becomes a short line. And all you are going to see is R. So my tau is, tell me how much R equivalent the capacitor is going to see. Right? So although you found Vc of zero plus given to you, Vc of infinity, you found it by a simple stuff. My next question is how much tau is? You need three unknowns. This, 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 and you're done. So how much is tau? You have a capacitor. This was your capacitor in the first place. Okay. I need you to tell me from point A and B, how much resistivity do, does the capacitor see? Since this is an independent source, I'm going to shut it down to zero. A voltage source shut down to zero is a short line. A current source shut down to zero is going to be an open line. So this is a voltage source, you shut it down to zero. What do you see? You are going to see this one is going to be a short line. Now is not the time for you to say, are they in parallel or are they in series? They are in parallel. Now you can see R1, you can grab it here. You can see R1 and R2 would be in parallel. And therefore this is going to be R1, R2 divided by R1 plus R2 times C. Okay, you found the three unknowns that I wanted you to find. How is my equation? Vc of t is equal to V of infinity. Plus V of zero plus minus V of infinity. Times, times e to the power of, because I don't have a space, I'm going to continue the times e to the power of minus t divided by tau. Tau is going to be r1, r2, r1 plus r2, c. I have a feeling you already know. If you wanted to go through actual proof to get to this stage, you already feel it's going to be a very difficult job to do. But what did we do? Tell me what is y of infinity is. Tell me what is y of zero plus is. Tell me what is your tau is. You got the equation. The only thing that you need to remember is this. The voltage of a capacitor cannot change drastically. That's all. The voltage of a capacitor cannot change drastically. The current of a resistor can. Nobody prevents it from. The voltage of a resistor can change drastically. The current of a, vol a voltage source can change drastically. The voltage of a capacitor cannot. The current of a capacitor can change drastically. Actually, you can tell me where the current of a voltage so, uh, the, a capacitor can change drastically. I'm not saying that you should do it, but I'm sure you have seen it by accident, of course. You see, take a look at the car battery. And there are two, uh, basically, boosting wires attached to it. And for, by accident, you actually put them together. What happens? You can see sparks flying up. So what is those sparks coming in? It's a huge current that goes. The current can change. But if you didn't keep it too long, if you take it off uh, on time, the voltage is, is still going to remain 12. If you keep it for too long, it's going to explode. You can see that the size are going to explode. The size of the car battery is going to become curvy. So I'm going to take a few times off, a few minutes off. Uh, I'm going to see what I can do. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to exercise. I'm going to work on this. Okay?